He is a three-time winner of Canada Canada's newspaper, sorry, Canada's National Newspaper Award, the top honor in Canadian print journalism. He's also the first Canadian to ever win an Associated Press Sports Ed Editor's Prize in the United States for the top circulation category of newspapers, which he did in 2006 while writing for the Toronto Star. The past year, Jeff finished fourth in the country in the APSC voting for a story on the rape case involving a former Mariners pitcher and what the team knew about it before acquiring from the Texas Rangers. The same story garnered Baker a Society of Professional Journalists Award for the best sports reporting in 2010 in its West, Western Washington chapter. Jeff is going to talk to us uh, a little bit today about the Mariners and how the Moneyball myth helped the Mariners and other teams get richer by spending less. Please welcome Jeff Baker. <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me here. It's, it's great to be back. I, I actually told some people this story earlier. I, I got married 10 months ago today at uh, DeLille Cellars over in uh, Woodenville. And this was actually the hotel where we stayed uh, for two days with all my guests and everybody here. So this is the first time I've been back at this hotel since. So I don't know what that means, but it was actually 10 months ago today. So I think there's got to be some symbolism there. Do I have to pay a buck now? Or <laughs> 10. Uh, 10. Yeah, oh man, I'm to raise it. No, it's, it's great to be here, and you know, I, I don't want to get too complicated with, with this talk because it really is a, it's a complex issue, um, but I'm going to try to break it down in about 20 minutes or less, uh, hopefully less. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have seen the movie Moneyball. There's a movie out there called Moneyball with Brad Pitt, and it'll probably get a little uh, Oscar attention once, once that comes up in a couple of weeks, and it's actually based on a book that was written eight years ago, nine years ago actually, by a guy named Michael Lewis. And, and I gotta say, both the book and the movie have one thing in common. They, they were both entertaining, I thought. Uh, you know, I thought the movie was, was mildly entertaining, and I thought the book was very entertaining. Um, and the other thing that they have in common is that uh, the reality of what they're saying, the, the reality of, of the story they're trying to tell is actually far different than what you actually saw in the book or, or what you saw in the movie. And, um, it, you know, put it this way, the people inside baseball who have read the book, they know that there's some merits to it, but they also understand that, that the, the real story is far more complex than was detailed in the book or in the movie. The movie was, was based largely off the book. And what, what the story is, is how the Oakland Athletics, with a general manager named Billy Bean, um, were able to compete on a payroll that was much smaller than their largest competitors. And the way that the book says they did this is by using all kinds of newfound statistics to go out and get a bunch of misfit players, sort of a bad news bears assortment of players that nobody ever heard of, and they were able to take on giants like the New York Yankees and fight them to a standstill and then make the playoffs on a, on a small payroll. Part of that is true, but the part that the book doesn't talk about and the part that the movie completely ignores is the fact that they had three top pitchers on that Oakland A's baseball team. The equivalent of about three Felix Hernandez's, for those of you who, who follow the, the Mariners. So a lot of the book's premise was flawed, a lot of the movie's premise was flawed, but they were still great stories to tell. I mean, and they were partly true as well, because the Oakland A's, with a very small payroll, were able to make the playoffs. They just had a lot of help from, from the kind of guys that they haven't had since, and, and that's why a lot of what they did nine years ago hasn't been replicated since. The A's are now uh, a distant third-place team in the same division as the Mariners, and the only thing keeping them out of last place are the Seattle Mariners. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want to get too caught up in the book. That's another argument for another day, but the reason I'm bringing this up is... One of the unintended legacies, I think, of the book Moneyball, which has become almost a Bible of sorts in the sporting world and in the business world, because a lot of its, its ideas were very were accurate and were good ideas, trying to capitalize on, on, on undervalued markets, on undervalued commodities and baseball players. Now, in theory, that's great. That's not what the Oakland A's really did on a large scale, but the theory of the book was sound. And what that book did was it spawned a whole new generation of baseball fans, a lot of them Harvard-educated types, uh, just educated types in general. It got this young community of, of people who are 20, in their 20s and 30s uh, interested in baseball again. And baseball had been looking for that for years. But th this community of fans had something else in common. 
they were very interested in the story of Moneyball and how this general manager, Billy Bean in Oakland, was able to go out and compete on a budget by using these undervalued market principles. And as a result of that, these fans not only became fans of Major League Baseball, but they became fans of the style that Billy Bean brought to baseball, the management style. And they became fans of general managers like Billy Bean, who also applied this buy low, sell high concept in players, this seeking out undervalued markets, this cost efficiency when it comes to running baseball teams. And for a lot of these fans, it wasn't enough to go out and see the team win. I'm convinced of this. It wasn't enough to go out and see their teams win. They wanted their teams to win the so-called right way by being cost efficient, by not spending as much as the New York Yankees, and not spending as much as the Boston Red Sox. And they became fans of the general managers who emulated this style. And teams which had man general managers who didn't emulate this style uh, the fans of those teams wanted those teams to change their general managers and bring in managers, general managers like Billy Dean, who could be cost effective. And over the years, I, you know, I do a lot of online work on the internet, and I've gotten to know a lot of these communities. And, and I, I've, I've seen this trend develop over the last nine years that, that's tough to miss. And it doesn't matter whether it's taking place in Seattle, in Toronto, in New York, California, Tampa Bay, fans. And bloggers, internet bloggers, in those cities are big fans of being cost effective. And that's great. I mean, we all say, what's wrong with being cost effective? What's wrong with getting the best bang for your buck? There's nothing wrong with it. If you're you know, running a business, if you stand to make profits from that business, you want to be cost effective, make as much money as possible. But the question I, I keep asking in my mind is, why would these baseball fans care unless they have a stake in their teams. Why do they care so much about whether their teams are cost effective or not? And I ask this question to people, and, and they, the answer I normally get from fans is, well, if our team is cost effective, if they're not spending a lot of money right now, they're saving lots of money so that later on, when they're ready to win games, because that's what we're all fans of sports for, is to watch our teams win games normally, um, if they save all this money, then in a few years down the road, we'll be able to win games because we'll have more money to spend on the good players to bring in when we're ready to win. And that's generally the kind of answer that I hear, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, logically, yeah, you'd want your team to be cost effective and not waste money on players so that you'll have money in reserve to really go out and get good players later on. Problem is, Major League Baseball is not like the National Football League where there's a salary cap where it doesn't matter how big or small your market is, every team is equal in the National Football League. Major League Baseball is very different. In Major League Baseball, there is no salary cap. So the New York Yankees can spend $200 million, and the Tampa Bay Rays can spend $40 million, and they still have to compete in the same division. And now, if you're looking at cost-effectiveness, you would think, yeah, the Tampa Bay Rays really have to be cost-effective because they have no money to spend. That's the theory anyway. So you want them to be cost effective. But then you have to ask yourself, well, if you're the New York Yankees, does it matter if you're cost effective? Not really. If you're spending $200 million on payroll and $100 million of that is wasted on bad acquisitions, you've still got $100 million of good payroll being spent, and that easily dwarfs the $40 million that the more cost effective teams are spending. And what does this have to do with anything? You're all sitting there asking yourself. He's throwing a lot of figures out there. The majority of teams in baseball are not like the Tampa Bay Rays. The majority of teams in baseball are not like the Oakland Athletics, who have no publicly subsidized stadiums to play in, who are not getting um, the bulk of their revenues off of a facility that's generated through tax dollars. The majority of major league teams play in publicly financed baseball fields. They see a lot of their revenues coming in from, thanks to the goodness of taxpayers, and a lot of these baseball teams can afford to spend a lot more than they're actually spending right now. The problem is, they're under no pressure to do it. 